On today, we have the final day that you can take your test. On Monday, I'll not be here because I've been called to do my civic duty and show up for jury duty. So I got to go. Kyle will be here. He will cover information that will be on your test. So uh, if you want to retake test three, there's two days you can do that next week. Uh, Tuesday, April 8th. 3 to 5, or Thursday, April 10th, 11, 15 to 1, 15. Got to have your three events, but other than that, you're good to go if you want to do the retake. So, slide show. Let's get into this stuff. We're talking about humanism, humanistic psychology, Abraham Maslow. So I've got Maslow's self-actualization. You'll remember that we talked about already looking at Mr. Rogers, not Fred Rogers, but Carl Rogers as a... Humanistic psychologist. I think I need to change the lights up here for the filming. Sorry about that, Jason. And preset. Uh -huh. There's that set right there. My bad. I got talking and not paying attention to what I should be doing. And that one. Y'all in the back should get some lights. Orange hat. This one right here little bit and then them's right there there we go take two Abraham Maslow we're talking about the humanistic psychologist as we were talking about before we have already covered uh, Carl Rogers and his client-centered therapy when we get into abnormal psychology and talk about the disorders that people might encounter in their life and how to go about therapy, you'll see Carl Rogers again because the humanistic movement changed things. Again, it was a reaction against psychoanalytic points of view and behavioristic points of view, and it held that you have this ability as a human being to grow, to change, that you have an inner directedness, that you have a uniqueness and free will. So look at Abraham Maslow, he developed this hierarchy of needs. And you might say, well, when will I ever use that kind of stuff? I've seen this hierarchy of needs used in business. I've seen it used in sports. It's a pretty handy concept. It's an idea that helps understand human needs. So he has it labeled in a hierarchy where some needs take precedence over other needs. Where his overall point is that you have the ability to grow. Not only do you have the ability you're compelled to grow. You have to grow unless something gets in your way. You have to be all you can be unless circumstances limit you. So if you look at an acorn, for example, right? If an acorn falls into fertile ground, gets buried at the right time, has enough sunlight, has enough rain, has enough space, it has no choice, right, but to become a massive tree. Assuming its genetics will allow it, it has no choice but to do that. So in other words, it has to grow. It has to develop. But life ain't always like that, right? That acorn might fall near a squirrel, and that's the end of that acorn, right? Or it might fall into ground that's not nutrient-rich. It might not have enough water. It may not have enough light. It may get various amounts of that. It may be too many trees in the area crowded in. Right? All kinds of circumstances might arise to prevent that acorn from becoming the tree it was destined to be. That's the same idea here. There's a lot of circumstances and obstacles in your life that prevent you from reaching your full potential, but where the psychodynamic and behavioral schools of thought thought, well, you know, that's just what it is, and you're kind of limited to who you are. The humanist thought, you can get around that. If you can understand your circumstances and better understand yourself, you can change your circumstances. And as such, you'll have no choice but to go higher and higher up this pyramid of needs. So at the bottom, we got physiological needs. You have to have these met. These are survival needs. These are primary reinforcers when we look at to behaviorism, right? You've got to have food. You've got to have shelter from the, from the elements. But beyond that, the next level up is safety. If you've got food and shelter, that doesn't mean you're necessarily safe, right? So safety would be protecting yourself against hostile forces from the world. It might be your neighbors. It might be your government, right? It might be an enemy of the state of some type. But we lock our doors if we have doors to lock. If you see what I'm saying, if you're homeless, you have no doors to lock, right? You have no place to go. So what are you worried about? eating first. Second to that, you find a place to stay where you feel some security. 
if this is met, then you can really move into love and belongingness where you have feelings for other people and they reciprocate and return those to you where you feel part of a family or part of a community, part of an intimate relationship. In that sense, you have a different level of fulfillment of your needs. Once these are filled, then you feel good. You have now reached self-esteem needs, feeling good about yourself because you have what you need to live. You have a place that you feel comfortable and safe. You have people that love you and you love them. Naturally, it follows that you start to work on feeling the best you can about yourself. Esteem needs now need to be met. And then, once you're feeling as good as you can possibly feel about yourself and you've got security all down through that pyramid, you move into this top pinnacle part called self-actualization where you become all you can be. You realize your full potential. You exercise what has been latent but has been yearning to be part of your self because it is part of yourself. It's part that's been hidden by circumstances that have prevented you from being the person you could be. But once you've got all these obstacles removed, you can't help but be the person that you were meant to be. In fact, before he died, Maslow actually went a step further and blew the top off the pyramid and said, once you've finished all of these things, you're not satisfied. It's not fulfilling anymore to be all you can be. Now you have to turn outward to get your fulfillment. Now you have to give back. Now you might give back in any of these stages. One of the critiques of any stage theory is that you may be in multiple places simultaneously, right? Just because you lose your job doesn't mean your family doesn't love you anymore. But believe me, if you lose your job, you don't start reading philosophy. You start reading want ads, right? You start readjusting your life based on the primary needs. As they're satisfied, you move up or down this hierarchy. But once you're fully satisfied, you take kind of these, these pinnacle people that we look to, JFK, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Mother Teresa. What did they do with their lives once they'd satisfied all their personal needs? They then went to trying to satisfy social needs. It wasn't satisfying just to be the best they they could be. They had to go further and do more to help others. They moved up past self-actualization. That interdirected need to fulfill one's potential, though, from Maslow's point of view, is something most people never achieve. They don't reach it. If they do, they have these things called peak experiences, which aren't on your test, but clearly are on your slide. The idea that you have these little epiphanies, these little revelations, these little moments of clarity where you see yourself connected to the greater world or the greater community in a way that really is life-changing potentially, but they come and they go. People have a peak experience and then it leaves and then they're back into life, right? Well, when everything's going really, really well with your life, you have these inklings of what you might do with it, these special things, right? You reach for your ideal self. If we look at Carl Rogers' terminology, right? You reach to be the best you can be, knowing you can't ever be perfect. Now, we're going to move from the humanistic and the psychodynamic and the behavioral into a thing called trait theory. And I just have this little video that I think helps to look at it. With a little humor and a little understanding, you'll see that what we have is a bunch of scientists arguing with each other, constantly arguing with each other about the way it is, quote unquote. So this is a little bit of argument clinic for you. Oh, oh, just a five minute. Thank you. Thank you, I did. You were certainly not. You know, it's a big lot. It's a big lot. No, it's an argument. No, it's a big lot. No, it's a big lot. Yes, it is. It is. You just want to dig me. Oh, yes, it is. No, 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 no. It did. Just let me know. Nonsense. Oh, this is cute. No, it is. Okay, it's an argument. It's an argument. Well, the argument is not the same as contradiction. Standing. No, it's not. The argument is connected to a statement to establish that it's a proposition. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Isn't that contradiction? Look, if I argue with you, I must say that I'm contradiction. But it isn't just saying no existence. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> argument is a natural process. Contradiction is just an automatic 
day and say, and it's the other person says, Is it you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Morning. Uh, oh, just getting interested. Sorry, five minutes ago. <laughs> that was now five minutes just now. Very close. Very close. Sorry, I don't know you anymore. <laughs> what? You're not on you're going to play with those ideas. But that was now five minutes just now. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm very sorry, but I don't drive on the platform on every day. Oh, all right. There you are. Well, well, what? That was never five minutes just now. Oh, you were just paid. Oh, just paid. I did. 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 I could be arguing when I stand up. There you go. So when we look at all of the intelligence theories that we have, and we start to look at all of the personality theories we have, you find that it isn't a concluded topic, right? Personality is complex. I already pointed this out before. There are a lot of different perspectives on it. But what we're trying to do it's a connected series of statements established, intended to establish a proposition. It isn't just saying, no, it isn't. You have to actually have data to bolster or refute somebody else's argument. Either you're bolstering your own argument or you're refuting somebody else's argument. So we have all of these kind of nebulous constructs going around from psychoanalytic perspectives and humanistic perspectives. But what are these things that we call personalities anyway? And as I said before, when you think about your personality, you probably start thinking of a few descriptor words, a few adjectives. When you think about your own best friend, or your mother, or your father, or somebody you grew up with, or somebody you work with, you don't think about their id and their ego and their superego, right? You think about these descriptors, these adjectives, these concepts, whether they're trustworthy, whether they're friendly, whether they're whatever, whatever, whatever. The concepts are the labels we apply to what we think are relatively stable patterns of behavior, right? So that we have consistency, and that consistency is what we consider to be identity. And that identity, we think, is going to be part of a person's life. Gordon Allpart kicked it off, really, in the trait theory, identifying more than 4,500 traits on three levels. 4,500 traits. How did he do this? He was looking through the dictionary. And what he found was adjective after adjective after adjective that can be used to describe human beings to one another or to oneself. And by looking at that, he tried to organize this into what he thought were cardinal traits. Cardinal traits are relatively rare. Cardinal traits dominate most of your life so that you're affected by a central aspect of your personality. I should be careful with the word central. Total pacifism, for example, became the guiding principle for almost everything that Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi did in their public lives, right? They were pushed like normal human beings into some very, very uncomfortable positions by highly aggressive people who most of us would then react to aggressively or at least defensively, but that cardinal trait caused them to react differently than most people would. And in that sense, they were unique. But for most of us, we have these general kinds of personality traits that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's see if I can get that up here. For most of us, we have central traits and secondary traits. In other words, a cardinal trait is rare because there's rarely one trait that guides almost all of our behavior, right? Lots of traits, theoretically, contribute to who we conceive ourselves to be. Central traits would be prominent and general traits, building blocks of personality, where Gordon Allport thought most people had five to ten of these. 
secondary traits or dispositions that vary from situation to situation that often flow out of these central traits. You display them occasionally depending on the situation, but they're not totally inconsistent with your central traits. Raymond Cattell came along and used a technique we call factor analysis. It's a statistical approach to understanding and analyzing data to take this massive number of traits and reduce them into what he thought were 16 basic traits. The ones that hit for him are central traits. Now for each of those 16 traits, he would have thought there were other sub-traits that were important to understand. Now, I just highlight these because that's the history of it. And then we move on to more test relevant material. And we get into Hans Isink. Hans Isink looked at traits slightly differently. It's almost like uh, there's that old game show, Name That Tune. He said, I can name that tune in eight notes. Somebody else goes, I can do it in five notes. Somebody else goes, I can do it in four notes. And they go, name that tune. See if you can name a tune in four notes, right? And it's almost like you got, you got all four saying it's a bunch of traits. And, and then you've got Cattell you going, it's 16 traits. And then you got Isaac going, it's three traits. But I'm really going to emphasize two traits. So you're looking at different people arguing over very similar principles and looking for evidence. So he says there's three bipolar trait dimensions. And when I say bipolar, I mean one extreme versus the other extreme. When we get to the big five, it should become apparent what I'm talking about. But one bipolar dimension that he thought was prominent in all human beings was introversion versus extroversion. Now most people say, oh yeah, he's extroverted or he, she's kind of shy, she's sort of introverted and they have a general sense of what that means. Those descriptors have been around a long time since at least the uh, Socratic school of philosophy, Aristotle and the like. Uh, for Isaac, it's really about physiological levels of arousal. For him, it's looking at what kind of state of arousal are you typically in and you usually seek its opposite. So that if you have low levels of physiological arousal characteristically, you would seek higher levels of arousal by engaging the social world or being really outgoing or bravado might be part of that. That gets into some subdivisions of these. But if you already have lots of internal arousal and you already have this kind of characteristic high level of arousal, you seek the opposite. You seek calm. You seek serenity. You seek not necessarily social isolation because introverts aren't people who don't have any social relationships. They have chosen relationships. They, it's not that they can't engage in social activities, but they prefer more often than not more solitary activities. Now if you see these as extremes, then you can imagine a normal distribution being laid on that bipolar dimension, where very few people are extremely extroverted all the time. And very few people are extremely introverted all the time. Where would you expect them to be? Toward the middle. Maybe leaning this way or leaning that way, predominantly. But situationally, we might see people, for example, in a job interview, if you're very introverted, you might be assertive in a job interview, for example. Somebody who gets up on stage and talks a lot in front of large numbers of people doesn't do that all the time. Sometimes they like to just have a quiet book and sit at home and maybe watch Jeopardy or something like that. Just quiet time reading or watching some kind of TV or listening to music. So you see that nobody seems to display all of these traits in all situations, but that you have a characteristic level of preference for introversion versus extroversion, which he's explaining as a genetic basis, saying that there's some heredity involved here. He also looked heavily at this neuroticism and emotional stability. Now you see I've got these two bolded in addition to having Heinz Isink being white fonted. So neuroticism and emotional stability really looks at a person's reactivity to life. Some people are pretty stoic. It takes a lot to rattle them and even when they get rattled they don't look that rattled to the rest of us, right? They seem to take everything in stride, maybe aren't that emotional at all. Could that be problematic to show no emotion? It could be if you were extreme on the trait because that would make it hard to connect to other people. 
but very few people are that stoic or that stable. On the other side, you have people that might be easily rattled, easily flip out over quite little problems that come up in their life. And they have a lot of lability, meaning they move up and down in their emotions all the time. And that can be an instability. And that instability can be problematic. Now, most people aren't extremely unstable or extremely stable. Most people toward the middle. They lean towards one or towards the other, depending on the situation. And he looked at these two different traits as, ex as explaining a lot of personality. He had this other thing called psychoticism and impulse control. Impulse control, the ability to restrain one's impulses, right? Where people, you could be over controlled, right? You never take a chance, you never take a risk, you never go outside your comfort zone, you don't grow because you're rigid. And the other side would be, you do anything that comes to mind, regardless of the consequences, overly impulsive. And of course, most people aren't one extreme or the other. They're towards the middle, leaning one way or the other. Well, for your own test and knowledge, he really emphasized more the one and the two. And I'll show you a, a graphic here of how that worked. He thought there were higher order traits. Major trait would be extroversion, for example. But he didn't think that was the only trait. If you have somebody who's extroverted, it gives rise to these kind of secondary or suborder traits, lower order traits, like assertiveness, right? So out of extroversion, you could get assertiveness or aggressiveness. They're not the same thing. And not everybody who's extroverted would be aggressive, and not extroversion does not guarantee assertiveness in every situation. And so he looks at these first two domains as really explaining habit which is to say our stable aspects of personality and specific responses, which is to deal with situations, how we as people deal with situations. So higher order govern lower order traits. When you look at his two-dimensional model of personality, where we have stability versus instability, Right, what he would call neuroticism. And you have introversion versus extroversion. On this graph, you can kind of look and see it as a normal distribution. Very few people are extremely introverted, or extremely extroverted, or extremely stable, or extremely instable. Most people are going to be tending towards the middle, leaning towards introversion or towards extroversion, leaning towards instability, or leaning towards stability. But he would say that you could map these out that a person who was highly extroverted and highly stable, right? Be sociable, maybe even a leader, right? Responsive, talkative. So you see this quadrant is a combination of people who have stable emotional natures who are also extroverted. Flip that over and people who are introverted and unstable, you have that kind of moodiness, anxiousness, rigidness, social isolation, pessimism. But again, most people aren't extreme. But you swing it around from introverted to stable and you see that these become different adjectives. We're looking at thoughtful, peaceful, controlled, reliable, even tempered. And on the flip side of extroverted and unstable, we start going to impulsive, excitable, aggressive, restless. It's an interesting concept because it explains a lot with two bipolar dimensions or traits. That's nice. The problem is two doesn't seem to do it. So we add 4,500, we had 16, we had two, can I get a five? Five factor model of personality. Five factors, I've been talking about this a little bit. I've talked about it in mnemonics. If you remember, we talked about ocean. The big five, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Those are ones I've said before, but the mnemonic spells ocean. My son once pointed out to me it also spells canoe. So if you want to put a canoe on the ocean, when you're looking at a test item that talks about five factors of personality, you better see five things that begin with O-C-E-A-N. But let's go a little bit deeper than that. Openness. What is that as a trait? Well, it's a bipolar trait to extremely open, to extremely closed, rigid, not open to new ideas. The opposite of it. You could be too open, couldn't you? Too open-minded? They say, don't let you, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out, right? 
You don't take every new idea and just assume it has validity and run with it. You should be critical and evaluate it. On the flip side, you don't want to be closed to every new idea. You want to be able to receive new information and evaluate it, maybe use it. Of course, most people aren't extreme. They're, they lean a little conservative, they lean a little liberal, they lean a little neophobic and, or infophobic and a little bit neophilic or infophilic, right? Open to these kinds of new ideas or kind of closed to new ideas based on their predispositions. Well, these predispositions are traits. They're not good or bad. They're just different ways humans could be. Look at conscientiousness. Well, that's rule bound, really. Being able to be organized, disciplined, dependable. Well, the opposite would be unconscientious. Somebody that you can't rely on because they're not dependable because rules, be they social work rules, work rules, laws, whatever, they don't really value them. Now, very few people are extremely unconscientious and very few people are extremely conscientious. Extreme conscientiousness could also be a problem. You could be so rule bound that you can't make exceptions when they need to be made, right? That you have no flexibility because you're so rigid about following the predetermined order that you can't see any other opportunities for change or flexibility. Extroversion, we've already talked about, so look at there. Well, extroversion was Isaac's idea as well as Cattell's idea, as well as Alpert's idea, as well as Aristotle. What do you know? Aristotle got one right. Go Aristotle. All right, so we have, that seems to be a case, that that is a verifiable trait in humanity, and we've already gone over the extremes of those. Now we've got agreeableness. That has to do with your ability to get along with other people. You could be disagreeable. Y'all probably know somebody who's disagreeable in your life, right? Everything is negative. Everything is a controversy. Everything is an argument. Everything is disagreeableness with them. But you probably don't know that many people like that because it's unusual to be extreme on any dimension. As we get to personality disorders, we'll see that when you get to the level of disorder, we're talking about extremes not some kind of unique and new dimension that never has been seen before. But the flip side of that is agreeableness. Meaning you'll go along with anything anybody says at any time to get along. The person who's so conflict avoidant that they are now put upon in ways that makes them very uncomfortable but they can never tell anybody because they wouldn't want to be disagreeable. You know anybody like that? They just, they won't, they will not cause a controversy no matter what. They just can't bring themselves to do it. So you can see that being too agreeable might be problematic. Being too disagreeable might be problematic, but most people aren't extreme. They lean a little this way or they lean a little that way. Right? And then we have the fifth, which is neuroticism. So Isaac wins again. He's still there. He's still in there. So we still got this tendency towards being anxious, hostile, insecure, vulnerable versus the other side of it where you have rigid stability. An, an inability to really express or experience emotions so stable that emotion seems to be absent. And as human beings, we value emotion collectively, right? We experience emotion, and it's a key part of being a human being. You've got on Star Trek, you've got your Spock, and you've got your Mr. Captain Kirk, right? Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk as extremes. One is overly rigid with the emotions, and the other one is overly emotional. And they both come together and form complementary teams because sometimes each of these can be an advantage, and each of them can be a disadvantage depending on the situation. But that's where most people are flexible. Personality disorders are inflexible. They're maladaptive. They're extreme, and they don't adapt well to situations. Most people can adapt their personality to the situations. Evidence for cross-cultural validity is what really bolsters this model. It does seem to occur in almost all cultures studied. Now, certain cultures tend to lean one way or another collectively versus other cultures, but the traits themselves seem to be present. So in that sense, it doesn't settle the argument as to what is personality. When you start looking at unconscious constructs, those are very hard to operationalize. When you start looking at people's human potential, those are very hard to operationalize. When you look at behaviors, well, those are easy to operationalize and easy to verify, but they don't quite give you know, credence to the depth of human experience that we all know that we have. And so you look at this as just another perspective on human personality but one that has a lot of validity because it's highly measurable. And that's just to 
reinforce for you. Ocean or canoe. <laughs> so openness, imaginative, practical, right? Are you open or closed? Interested in variety or interested in routine? Independent or conforming? Conscientiousness, highly organized or disorganized? Really careful or really careless? Really disciplined, really impulsive? Extroversion, and that's where you would have found psychoticism of Isaac being subsumed, right? But it's broader than just impulsiveness. Extroversion, sociable, retiring, we know this one. Agreeableness, soft-hearted, ruthless. Trusting, suspicious, helpful, uncooperative. And then out here on emotional stability, really calm, really anxious, really secure, really insecure, self-satisfied or self-pitying, where extremes are the problem and the middle is the norm. Now, how do you test personality? We've been talking about testing almost since the beginning. We got into biology and then we got into talking about some constructs and how to operationalize those in the research part of that first section of material. How do you measure stuff in psychology? Are we really a soft science that we don't really touch on anything that's real? No, we're a difficult science because the things we try to understand are very difficult to measure. Given great precision, science advances rapidly. Given total imprecision, you have no science at all. In the middle, and leaning towards greater precision, at least in spirit, we have sciences that are in the social sciences and we lean towards the hard sciences as a discipline. Because what we try to do is to measure with the greatest precision possible constructs that are hard to measure. Doesn't mean they don't exist because they're hard to measure. It means you have to be creative, but not just creative. You have to be willing to let go of theories and hypotheses when the data refutes what you believe to be the case. So you're refining knowledge. Objective tests are one way to measure personality traits. Now I've got them on white font and asterisk because one of the strengths of an objective test is that it has, generally speaking, good reliability and good validity and it's easy to determine whether it has good reliability it's a little less easy to determine if it's valid, but it's determinable. In the same way when we looked at IQ testing, right? If you test high on IQ, you would expect that to predict certain kinds of outcomes in terms of somebody's ability to do or not do certain kinds of abstract intellectual work or when we got into Gardner's multiple intelligences, whether they could do music or not music, or they understood bodily movements or didn't really, they were really clumsy versus kind of the traditional things that we measure with intelligence tests which map onto academic work. So if you score high or low, that should predict certain kinds of outcomes and if it does predict the predicted outcomes, then it's probably valid. And if it's valid, it should be reliable, right? But if it's reliable, it does not necessarily mean it's valid. So one of the nice things about objective tests is they're empirically keyed and they are self-report. You're measuring everybody on the same standard, which enables comparisons. However, there are some problems. You've taken these studies on SONA, right? Most of you have taken at least one of these online studies. Well, that's what they're measuring, various kinds of self-reported information to see how things relate to one another. Well, when you have somebody ask you questions about your personality, are you really, do you like to go to parties? Very much like me, very much not like me. Uh, true, false, uh, strongly agree, strongly disagree. When you have everybody looking at the same stimulus, they're then introspecting. That thing we talked about with Wilhelm Wundt so long ago, right? I don't know, me, hmm, neutral. A little bit yes, maybe a little bit no. Each person is now empirically responding to the same stimulus, right? And if they're being totally honest with themselves and with the measure, then you have excellent reliability and probable good validity, and you have an ability to discern relationships as they exist or determine when they don't exist, or when one variable modifies or uh, modulates another variable mediates or moderates another variable. But one of the problems with these is that they're subject to deliberate deception. So that's really nice. You're taking a study on SONA and it says you're 
data is confidential and your privacy is valued, you can be as honest as possible. Please be as honest as possible, right? Because that helps us gain precision and validity. But what if I got a conscientiousness measure, for example? Do you follow the rules? Do you steal? Right? Do you ever take office supplies and you know, strongly disagree or true false, right? No, never. Well, if I go out and try to give that conscientiousness measure to prospective employees and it says things are, are you an honest employee? Yeah, yes or no. Or I am an honest employee. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. What are you going to answer if you try to get a job? Of course I'm a good employee. Of course, I never steal. I never do anything wrong. I always follow the rules. I'm a great employee. So you can just lie on these. You got to be careful because a lot of people will take research measures and take them out into the real world and just assume everybody's going to be honest, but not everybody scores high on conscientiousness, right? Guess who would be most honest? Those who actually score highest on conscientiousness. People who are scoring low on it be like, I'll tell you whatever I think you need to hear to get what I need out of this, right? So deliberate deception. Social desirability bias. People tend to, this is not a lie, they tend to believe themselves to be better than perhaps they are objectively warranted in calling themselves. So we look at people and you ask, for example, uh, are you above average, average, or below average on honesty? And you see about 90% of people think they're above average. Right? But you can't have 94% of people be above average. Does that make sense? But it's not that they're lying. They just tend to see themselves. What is above average? That's just a, it's just a stem, an item. You see it and you get three choices. People tend to skew themselves toward the positive. So, in other words, they're not completely objective with themselves, which is one of the problems with introspection, right? People are subjective with themselves. Now, some people, very few, relatively speaking, actually characteristically see themselves toward the negative. They bias themselves on the downside, but more often than not, people bias themselves toward the upside of anything that they see as socially desirable. And you got response sets. Please don't go through Sona going, agree, 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 give me my credit. And then tell anybody anything. All it does is screw up the research. But you can see how it would be easy to do that. I work with a colleague who does screening for, let's just say, a nuclear facility in the vicinity where you have to go through psychological screening to get a job. And this person got given a very, very long screening measure. The screening measure that was given was the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the most widely used clinical personality assessment inventory. It's got 567 statements on it. That's a lot of statements to read. And then you answer true or false. Now, if you answer true or false on any one statement, what does that tell you about somebody's personality? Virtually nothing. But when we aggregate factor after factor after factor after factor, lots and lots and lots of items on lots and lots and lots of different measures, we start to approach a pretty good picture of a trait or a characteristic. What happened with this fella is he got bored. And he didn't think this really mattered. And so he just started going down the down the thing, just putting stuff in randomly, he said. But he got flagged because it turns out it's got validity scales built into it. And it tells you when somebody's faking bad or faking good or has a really bizarre profile that's not something we can have any confidence in whatsoever. Right? So you might spike high or you might be low on various traits, but if you just fill in stuff randomly, this measure will know because guess what? 567 items, some of them are redundant. But when you get to item 13 and it says, you know, I enjoy parties, true. And you get to item 432 and it says, I hate parties. To be consistent, you'd have to put false, right? Because you said true to loving them, so hating them, you'd have to say that's not like me. So guess what? People who are filling in things randomly don't catch things like that. And did it matter? Yeah. He wasn't going to get a job. But my colleague said, let's talk to this person. Talk to the person. 
And my colleague, she said, what were you doing? He said, I just got really bored. There's a lot of paperwork and I just didn't think that mattered. And she's like, well, only if you want a job does it matter. And he's like, oh, I want a job. And she's like, let's let you do it again. And he had to do the whole thing again. And then we were able to see that, yes, he was fine. Just as he conjectured that he was fine. I also worked at, uh, as a, uh, well, y'all have a great weekend. Buckstock is tonight and tomorrow and Sunday. Get out there and enjoy your buck entertainment. <laughs>